Hey guys, today's video is going to be all about the 1031 exchange and exactly what it is and how it benefits you and kind of the rules and guidelines about how it works. So 1031 exchange is basically just a tax strategy for people who own investment properties. So if you're looking to sell an investment property, a lot of times when you go to sell the house, you have to pay capital gains tax on the proceeds that you get from the house. So say you buy it for $100,000 one year and a couple years later you decide you want to sell, sell it for $125,000, you're going to have to pay capital gains tax on that sale. Now there is a tax strategy called 1031 exchange where instead of just selling the property and pocketing the proceeds, you instead exchange it for a like-kind property. So the term like-kind property is relatively lenient. There's not a ton of rules and restrictions, although it does pretty much have to be real estate property. So you're not gonna be able to sell it for securities, bonds, any kind of financial assets or anything like that. However, you can trade it from say a residential home to an apartment complex or to a commercial building or to a vacant land. So in terms of like kind, it doesn't have to just be a house for a house or a condo for a condo or anything like that can really exchange it for any type of different real estate property. Now another rule is that you can't really exchange it for a primary residence and you cannot do it on a primary residence. So if you own your home, you can't 1031 exchange those gains when you go to sell it into an investment property. Now a primary residence has its own type of tax benefits when you go to sell, but you can't use the primary residence for a 1031 exchange and the same is for vice versa. So you can't sell an investment property and use those gains to then buy a primary residence. So how exactly does the 1031 exchange process work? What happens is when you decide you wanna go ahead and sell your property, you have to get a 1031 exchange intermediary involved. And a lot of times your local title company or someone will either have someone on staff or can point you in the direction of somebody who can help you with this process. So the rules are basically that you're not allowed to touch the money at any point throughout the process. When you go ahead and sell your property, you don't get to pocket those gains and then use it later when you go to purchase the new property. You have to have the money be given to the 1031 exchange intermediary and they're gonna hold on to that money until you close on the next property. Once you sell that first property, you've got to get with the 1031 exchange intermediary within 45 days and list out three potential properties that you are interested in purchasing as your next investment property. So from the day that you close on the sale of your first property, you've got 45 calendar days to establish a list of three other properties. Now, generally, you've probably already got in mind or maybe even under contract already on the property that you're looking to buy. So this 45 days really isn't too big of a deal and I recommend doing it sooner rather than later because if you list out the three properties you've got an interest in and all three end up going under contract within 45 days and you don't get a chance to buy those three, your 1031 exchange can be ruined. So you have to buy one of those three properties that you've listed. So then another timeline that you need to follow is not only the 45 days to establish the three properties that you're gonna be choosing from, you also have 180 days from the time that you close on the first property to the time that you close on the second property. So you need to make sure that your closing timeline fits within that 180 days so that your closing is not after the 180 days. Now another very important thing to consider is something that's referred to in the tax world as boot. So if you're not familiar with what that is, is it's basically cash or other type of financial asset that makes a property of equal value. So if I was giving somebody a $100,000 house and I was exchanging it for their $75,000 house, they would need to give me $25,000 cash or in another form of an asset to make the exchange equal. So that $25,000 cash is considered boot and is considered when talking about being taxed. So this is the case with a 1031 exchange as well, and boot can be considered in two different forms. So the very first form is obviously just gonna be cash. So for example, if you sell your property and you had a lot of equity and you got a lot of cash and you didn't put all of that cash in the purchase of the next property, whatever cash you get in your pocket is gonna be taxed at capital gains rate. So say you, know, you made $80,000 from your sale, 
but only use 60000 to buy the next house and you've got $20,000 in your pocket, that $20,000 in your pocket is going to be taxed. So the only way to avoid getting completely taxed is to not pocket any money in any form. So then the second form of boot is also gonna be in the form of reducing debt. So if you're buying a $100,000 house and then exchanging it for an $80,000 house, well, your mortgage is gonna be less. So say your mortgage goes from 80,000 to 70,000. Well, you've decreased your liabilities, your debt by $10,000. So that $10,000 is also considered boot. So any financial gain in the form of either less liability or less debt or cash in your pocket are considered boot and can be taxed at the capital gains tax rate. So the easiest way to avoid any of this hassle and headache and just to avoid being taxed at all is to buy a property of greater value. So if you're selling a $100,000 house, maybe look at buying a $125,000 house. Or if you've got an apartment complex you're selling for $300,000, maybe look at $400,000 so that you're always avoiding that gap in price difference. Another important thing to remember is that there are fees associated with using an intermediary for a 1031 exchange, which you are required to use. So bottom line, there are costs associated with doing this type of exchange. So for the 1031 exchange that I recently did, it was a $750 fee for the sale, a $375 fee for the repurchase, and a $35 fee for any time they needed to wire funds, which I think we only wired funds one, maybe two times throughout the whole process. So the 1031 exchange cost to us was roughly about $1,200. Now you have to keep in mind, we really had to weigh the pros and cons of actually going the 1031 exchange route with having those fees involved or just paying the tax that we were gonna have on the property. You need to kind of calculate and see which is gonna be more because it's possible that if your property is cheap enough, the 1031 exchange might be more expensive than just paying the tax on the property. So the tax basis is actually really important for how the gains are calculated on your property. So it's not just gonna be what you bought the house for minus what you sold the house for. There's a lot of other things involved in calculating your tax basis for the property. When you're calculating for what you bought it for, you're going to be able to take the purchase price of the house minus any costs associated with buying the house, such as closing costs, loan fees, title costs, legal fees, inspection, all of those types of costs. And you can also add up any improvements that you've done to the property, such as replacing the roof, remodeling the kitchen, adding on an extra bedroom, things of that nature that add value to the house. So that all totals up to be the cost of the house. And then when you go to sell, it's kind of the same thing. So the sale price of the house minus the commissions for selling the house, the closing costs, the legal fees, and things of that nature. So you get to subtract out a lot of things. It's not just what you bought it for minus what you sold it for to get your gain or your loss. It's really important to look back, total up those items, and make sure that the cost of the 1031 exchange is not gonna be more than what you're gonna be taxed for on just selling the property for. And now there are two kind of caveats that I wanna talk about. One of them is gonna be vacation rentals. So if you own a beach house somewhere that you were using as your second home, or it wasn't an investment property in any way, but you wanna try and get a 1031 exchange out of the property, then what you need to do is rent the property out for any period of time. There's no set standard, but call it maybe six months. And then if you're looking to sell that property to then swap it out for an invest, a different investment property, then you can 1031 exchange that property. Now, if you've never rented it out and it has never been an investment property in any kind of way, you're not gonna be able to 1031 exchange this property. And now the second caveat is going to be, if you've sold your investment property through a 1031 exchange and purchased another property that you then want to use as your primary residence, it's a little bit tricky, but it can be done. You kind of have like a two year period that you have to get around before you'll be able to use it as a primary residence and defer those capital gains. So the rules are that you have to rent the property out for at least 14 days or more each year for the following two years and your personal use cannot exceed the greater of either 14 days a year or 10 percent of the days that you've rented it out so if you use it as a rental for 100 days it cannot exceed 
10% of that so you can't use it for personal use for more than 10 days. So really, if you're trying to use it as a primary residence, it's just better if you wait the two years and rent it out and then later on you can convert it to your primary residence because the days and the timing and everything like that can get a little bit tricky and just maybe be more of a headache than it's worth. All right, guys, well, that is all I have for you today. I hope that opened your mind to what a 1031 exchange is and kind of helped clear up the whole process of what it is because I know when we were looking to do that for one of our properties, it was a little bit of a headache to kind of figure out all the necessary steps and people involved and the rules and everything like that. So hopefully this cleared it up for you and you can see a very important tax strategy as a real estate investor and can use it sometime going forward. Leave me a comment if you've got any more questions and I will look forward to seeing you guys in the next one. Talk to you later.